People like you, people like me, this is where we all find grace. Come on now. Bet you wanna sing hallelujah. Bet you say it ain't Can't help but celebrate being born again. Somebody who loves you is waiting at the door. It's home sweet home here in the house of the Lord. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, uh, the family of Emelech. His name was Boaz. And there was Ruth and Moab said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain in him whose eye sight I may find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. Verse 3, Then she left and went and gleaned the fields after the reapers. And she happened to come in the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Emelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. That's a way of sort of saying hello. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, And yet who is this young woman? So the servant was in the charge of the reapers, answered and said, It is the Moabite who came with Naomi from the country of Moab. I want to talk to you today about uh, being a person that is in love. You know, love is something that you have to work on. It's like I said, it's not a trait that's just there. You have to work on being in love. Is that true? You know, didn't you hear the old joke? This is what Cheryl did to me the other day. Sometimes I sit beside her and, I, you know, we're at the house and maybe I'll put her. She'll say, honey, do you remember when we used to snuggle and I'll put my arm around her and she'll snuggle close. And she said, do you remember when we held hands and with my other hand I'll reach over and hold her hand and she'll stroke my hand for a while. And She said, remember, you know, because we've been married 37 years almost. She said, do you remember when you give me a little kiss and I gave her a little peck on the cheek? And then she said, you remember when you used to nibble on my ears? And I jumped up and started leaving. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get my teeth. <laughs> Did you all get that? <laughs> that really didn't happen. Well, it probably could have happened. <laughs> what am I saying? <laughs> but love is something that you are taught. I believe that. Do you believe that? You have to teach children to love you and you teach them to be good and kind and sweet. You have to teach people around you to be in love. It's, it is not just something you require or it happens automatically. And in this story today, very quickly as we start off the series on love, I want to point out to you that love shows itself in acceptance of others. We all know this story. I actually just preached on it a few months ago about Ruth and Naomi and, uh, uh, you know, Naomi had a husband. He dies in a foreign country. She had two sons. They die. And she says to the daughter-in-laws, go back to your land, to your home, because there was a drought in Israel at that time. And you find somebody to marry. One daughter-in-law leaves. The other, who is Ruth, says, entreat me not to go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And so we get to the second chapter where they've come back into the area outside of Jerusalem. And, of course, they need food. Because, you see, in those days, there was no welfare. In those days, a woman had zero rights, and now her husband and her sons were dead, and so they were left to fend for themselves. And yet God had a wonderful plan for Ruth and Naomi. I want to point out something to you, too, that love is a commitment. I want you to say that with me. Love is a commitment. I want to point out to you in the story of this Ruth and Naomi that Naomi wasn't happy with her life. Too many times people get angry even at the love of God. And how do I know that? Because she said, change my name. God has left me bitter. Listen to that. How many people today, if calamity hits their lives, their families, as I preached last week, and I was listening to myself on the radio coming in this morning, on the radio station on 94.5, and I, you know, I said, how many people, if they lost financially everything they've worked for, 
would be bitter toward God. How many people do you see in life if they go through a long-term disability or sickness, the devil whispers to them, where is your God? And the next thing you know, they've given up their faith. Love is something that is taught. And love shows an acceptance of other people. Boaz comes on the scene. He's a wealthy man. He's going through all of his acreage that he owns. And all of a sudden he sees the reapers. He greets them. They greet him. And then he sees a young woman over there reaping. And he said, who is that? And they said, well, she's a distant cousin to your, your aunt or your, your cousin, uh, Naomi. And he has caught his eye on this woman. Listen to this. I want to point out to you that love has to be worked. Won't you say that with me? Love has to be worked. You have to work on your love in life. Again, it's not even just comes automatically. Folks, you have to love to work on your love. You have to work on your marriage all your life. I truly believe that. In my 37 years, if one thing I've learned is not to take for granted anything. Too many people in marriages take for granted of each other. And they say, ah, she'll be with me forever. He'll be with me forever. But you have to work on your marriage. Folks, you have to work on your friendship. The old saying, that is is true. Have a friend, you got to be a friend. Which means you have to work on these things. And it's even the same thing in the Lord's house today. Wayne Smith said one time years ago, the most dirtiest word to say in church, are you committed? And he said, boy, when I'd preach on that in front of 3,000 people in Lexington, Kentucky, he said, you'd have thought I'd have cussed some of them out. How dare you talk about a commitment? But we learned this commitment because that's exactly the way God was to us. You see, everything we learn about love comes from the Father above. And number one, God worked on His love. He created the whole world, did He not? Do you think that just happened? Do you think that just didn't? He worked on this earth because He loved it. And then He made man in His own image and breathed into His nostrils. The uh, the soul of God came into Him. And he loved Adam and Eve. He, he loved Adam. And then, of course, here comes Eve. He loved them so much, he put them in the greatest place, a garden that they could enjoy everything they had. But like so many people today, love can become tainted. You know, the word tainted means, that means it's bruised. That means it's, it's not like it used to be. Love is to be passed on. Number two, I really believe that. Love is a commitment and acceptance of others, but it's also to be passed on. God never intended you to keep love in your heart. He wants you to pass that on to your wife, to your children, to your husband, to the grandchildren, to family, to friends. He wants you to pass this on. How do I know that? That's exactly how Ruth and Naomi gets into this story. I want to remind you, I want to go back a few days before this, that Boaz was from the descendants of a woman that I preached on just recently in the book of Joshua named Rahab. A whore. A prostitute that was living in the city of Jericho. And she hides the spies. And the only thing she says, when you come back and put this city to the ground, remember me and my family. And she put the red scarlet out as the spies told her. And she spared her whole family. She comes and joins the Israelites. I want you to listen to this. She leaves her beliefs of false God and began to believe in the one true God. And isn't it amazing how God blessed Rahab, because out of her genealogy eventually would come the Son of God. Remember my point to you, love is not just a commitment, it's a commitment to accept other people. When you bring somebody in your life, whether it's a man or a woman or even a child, you have to have that commitment that you want to pass it on. It's not easy being a parent today, is it? 
I really do feel for the young couples in our church and I'm proud of them that they bring their kids to church and bring them to Kingdom's Kids and bring them to youth now because it's very hard on parents today. A lot of parents today, their mom is by herself and she has to be mother and father. But I want to encourage you to be a committed love Christian. A committed love Christian loves show and it shows love in the worst of times. I want you to listen to that. How many, again, people really love somebody, but then there's sickness, there's suffering, there's pain. We've got a lot of heroes in the faith here at this church, a lot of people who have done this and proven their love for their families. It may be a spouse who's become old or sickly or they have a problem. It could be, a, you know, a physical problem. It could be just age. It could be time. But I've watched these people stick with these people through the good days and even through the bad days. Why do they do this? Because they learn from the Master. The master teaches us to love. When you read 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter that describes what love is, it never says the word commitment, but everything that it illustrates is about commitment. Love is patient. That's commitment. Love is patient. That's commitment. Amen? Love is kind. That's what? Well, see, if you're awake and listening to me, <laughs> love is kind. That's a what? Love is not self-arrogant or self-esteem or seeks its own. Everything that the Apostle Paul that was given to him by the Holy Spirit was the word commitment. And too many people even in church today aren't really committed as they should. Again, when troubles come, heartaches come... What happens to them when they don't feel happy? You know, I'm about to celebrate in a few months if I live 41 years here. You can write anything on my story, but you better write the word commitment because it's the easiest thing for me to quit and retire and do what I want to do. But I'm committed because I watched other people commit. I watched other people give their life and sacrifice for this church and for the kingdom of God. I've watched my family members and friends and church people all around us be committed. I'm going to tell you what real love is. And I thought about this. One of the greatest examples I ever saw in this church of real love was the late Dick and Thelma Powell. Now, a lot of you new, new people don't know them, but if Dick was alive even today, he'd be close to 100 or right at it. He lived to be 95 or 96, but he led the choir for years. Can you believe that? A man in his 70s and 80s and 90s leading the choir. He was the church treasurer for years. Every Sunday, him and Thelma, who was the same age, by the way, would leave Calabash, North Carolina, drive down here. If he was singing even a solo at 8.30, he's here at 7.30 getting ready to sing. He had all of his music ready to go. He had all the choir. He had trained them and worked with them. He would stay here all day long. <laughs> He'd go back, him and Thelma would go upstairs and they would count the money and log the money. They were so good as a treasurer that the bank actually called us one day and said, who is your treasurer? And we said, well, it's Dick and Thelma Powell. What's that got? Why do you want to know that? They said, do they want a job? And Dick would stay until late in the evening after church, and then he would go home. He did that for years. And as, of course, as time come along, health started to fall. And sadly, Thelma, as we know, began to get sicker and sicker, and she was in the hospital, and God bless Darlene back there, and, and little Dynamite, uh, you know, they stayed there and helped and did things for them and watched after them and worked with them. But the night that she died, I watched Dick. I was there. I watched him. And I'm going to tell you what love was. It, it literally broke his heart as he watched his earthly one true love die. But he would say to me the very next day, I'm glad it happened the way it did. 
because Thelma did not have to go through the pain of burying me. And you know I'm going to tell you, you can write anything you can write on that story. <laughs> but you better write the word commitment. And you know what I found in marriages like that, in homes like that, when they've been married that long, the others don't usually last long, do they? And it wasn't but just a few, few months later, Dick became more frail. He even came in and told me one day, and Joel, he said, I just seem like, I, I don't know what to do. He said, I feel like somebody has took a huge knife and cut me down the middle because I'm always looking for help. She always would get up and make his breakfast and cook for them. She'd make sandwiches. And, of course, he'd take her out to eat. And they would work on everything from the business side of the church to the, again, he taught Sunday school. He taught an Old Testament class. My son knows the Old Testament better than probably most of you sitting here because he took for three years Dick's class on the Old Testament. Commitment. Love is a commitment. Naomi and Ruth were committed to each other. I don't think she was as much as, as Ruth was. But she was determined to do the right thing by her mother-in-law when legally she had no obligation to her at all. And by the way, she's a very nice looking young woman. She could have ran home and found her another husband. When you're pretty, the flies show up. Don't they? Huh? When you're ugly like me, you had to go hunt it. <laughs> Listen to me. It's the truth. <laughs> you know, you know, he's to deny it. You might as well just confess it, you know. But love, according to the Bible, shows itself in the worst of times. And love is to be passed on. Today, I want to challenge you today. Are you reading your five chapters every day? Are you studying God's Word? Are you growing more this year? Are you involved in our Bible college classes? Are you staying for Sunday school classes? Are you coming back on Sunday night and Wednesday and learning God's Word? If not, I have to ask this question not to be mean-spirited, but where's your commitment? I knew that'd go over well. That's a grand slam when you say that. Well, where is it? You know, the trouble why people don't grow spiritually in their lives, they're committed to other things, and I've found that to be true. I run a business on the side, and let me tell you something. I've learned, I've, I've been pretty good at this, and God's been very good to bless my little business, but let me tell you something. I'm committed to this church more than I am that work. And I think that's why God has blessed me through the years. Being committed ain't always the fun times. The years that Cheryl was sick and we went through the times of financial stress and trouble and sickness, there was nothing sexual about her, her situation. When you're laying there with your stomach wide open and you pack her and unpack her every day with a bag on her side. But I was committed the years that I've been sick in and out of hospital, surgeries after surgeries, she's always been right there. One night I was throwing up profusely at the hospital. Had to have emergency appendicitis. And bless her little heart, she was trying to hold that little plastic cup that they give you to throw up. And isn't that ridiculous? Why don't they give you a bucket? Yeah, that's Let's tell it like it is. You're sitting there puking all over that thing. And poor old Cheryl was just trying to hold it and catch it. I've seen that in other marriages here. I've seen that in families here. Your children are your children. I don't care if they're in the slop house or if they're in the highest place of the world. That's your kid. You need to be committed to that child. You need to be loving that child. If that child's not what it should be or doing, you need to ask yourself, maybe what did I do wrong or not do right? And then you may sit there and say, what can I do to keep loving my child and being committed to that kid no matter what? Because I want that child to go to heaven. Love is a commitment. It goes beyond even I lastly, but leastly, the comfort zone as time is running out. Naomi was able to love two daughters who were Moabites. I want you to listen to that. 
that the Israelites commanded not even to marry. Numbers 25, 17. Listen to what it says, 25, 17. Numbers, treat the Moabites as enemies and kill them. That's in the Bible. And yet Boaz comes and when he inquires who this woman is and when he finds out that down the lineage she'd been married to some of his distant, distant kinfolk, he showed her kindness. He told the reapers, leave some grain behind. Give her a little extra because I hear she's trying to take care of her mother-in-law. Listen to that. When you love God, and you love the right thing to do, it will shine and you won't have to talk about it. It'll just come out all the time. And God was going to change Ruth's life and Naomi forever in this story as we know. Love is an action that's pressed on and it reaches beyond the comfort zone. We're Almost to our gold at $50,000. We're less than $1,000. And I don't know if you've given or if you haven't. I've chosen, tried my best not to know these things. People sometimes come and give me checks to put in or things, and that's their business. But I'm going to ask you a question. Are you committed to what we're doing here? Are you committed? I talked to Donald Sanifer, who just got back from Puerto Rico, and He's been meeting with the engineers and the builders there. and We're just waiting for one more man to get the last bid in. But already we found out that we're going to have to spend about $25,000 more because the wall that's built all around it and behind it is going to fall. So we have to reassure that. Or re, re, uh, what's the word is it? We have to sure it up. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> and that costs money. When we get ready to start our fundraisers for that, will you be committed to that. One of the neat things that Donald Sandifer did share with me was that every day when they would go to the property to meet different contractors, different engineers, and all these people to and of course Donald is a tremendous builder, builds all over the Grand Dunes, and he builds million dollar homes. I mean the man knows what he's doing. He's very successful. Why'd you think I sent him down there? And you know what he said impressed him the most? Every day, are you listening? Those people on top of that mountain where this church will be, it's called the forgotten community. I mean, they write it all over their walls. They write it on the side of their houses. They put signs up. We are the forgotten city or the community in Ponce, Puerto Rico. That's the poorest of the poorest. Why do you think we picked it? But he said every day those people would show up and they'd bring him food. They'd bring him something to drink. They'd bring him a bottle of water. And they would sit there and say, are you going to build the church that we can come and worship in? Listen to that. Sammy's been there for three years, and he's committed to be there. God spared his life years ago when a bullet shattered his shoulder from a sniper when he was in the United States Army trying to guard a bunch of worthless civilians. I say worthless because they were, there, they were there to make money. That's why they were there. They were businessmen trying to make a profit out of something. And he took a bullet underneath his flap jacket to his shoulder. It traveled down his back and blew his kidney out. He said, the next thing I know, I'm standing in Iraq, and next thing I know, I'm in Germany and don't even know how I got there. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what it did for Sammy Munoz. And it separated him. I want you to listen to me. It separated him from Christians. He was thankful to be alive. He was committed to start going to church more. He started attending here. I preached his daughter's wedding. And the more he came, the more he got excited. And he helped start us our Spanish ministry and worked with that for years and then had the desire to go back to his home to build a church. He don't even receive a salary at all from nobody. Occasionally we do send money because that's just the right thing to do. But he don't take a dime. Why does he do that? Has he lost his mind? Has he gone crazy? Why, absolutely. He's crazy over Jesus. 
He's crazy over the love. He's in love with Jesus. He's committed to the cause. And his wife and his family is too. And God has richly blessed them. A person that is committed always the best is at the end. And I'm not talking about just dying and getting to go to heaven. I'm talking about even the end of what you think of your life. Ruth laid at his feet. When he wakes up, the Bible says in the second chapter and the third chapter, I just won't take time to read it, but I hope you go home and read it. He startled at midnight, wakes up and looks, and there's, a, there's that woman laying at his feet. And I would be startled too, let's tell the truth. If last night I went to bed and was laying there, and all of a sudden I feel something at my feet and look down there, and it ain't sure laying there, another woman, I'd, I'd be a little startled too. <laughs> what are you doing there? <laughs> Won't you listen? She said, I am here to be your servant. We know the rest of the story. Later on in the next chapters, he would go against the grain of time and against his culture, and he married this woman, not because she was just a very attractive woman. You know, when you're wealthy, you can get married to anybody. And usually money buys looks. Am I right? I don't care if you're a woman. You got a lot of money, you can get you a good looking man if you want to. They'll flock to you. But I truly believe when Boaz heard the story of Ruth, how she refused to go back home, refused to get married, that she had converted to Judaism and to the one true God, when she saw her out working for her mother in law, I think that got his attention, just to be honest. I said, I think he said, man, that's a woman I could, I need her in my life. She's a go-getter. Love is not just a commitment. I want you to listen to me. Love is not just an action. Love is true work. Most people never achieve greatness in life because, let's be honest, they're too lazy to go the extra mile. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say seek ye first a woman or your husband. I, that doesn't mean you don't love them. Matter of fact, I think if you love the Lord, you'll be a better husband, better wife, a better mother, a better father. You'll be what the Bible says that you should be. Put her needs above you, her time above you, her wants above you. Jesus is not impressed with the money that you give. I want you to listen carefully. But he is impressed of how much you love. Father, I love you today. I don't preach this to hurt people's feelings, make people mad, to insult their lives. But I preach this because sooner or later the truth needs to be said to any human being. There's somebody that needed this sermon today. It may not be anybody in this audience. It may be somebody on the television that will watch us next week. It may be somebody on the radio next week that will listen to this and say, I need to fall in love with Jesus. People like you, people like me, this is where we all find grace. Come on now. 